everyone, and welcome to Sage of Fables, and I am your host, the Fabled Sage. I wanted to talk to you all today about a deck that is incredibly near and dear to my heart, a deck that I have... I built it ever since it was spoiled, and I just absolutely love playing it. I love tinkering with this deck. I love... You know, seeing how it performs, seeing how my changes alter the performance, new lines that I can find. And, you know, I just, I would really, this is my, you could say this is my love letter to my mean jelly bean, my four color savior, Omnath Locus of Creation. This is a competitive deck, um, a CDH deck to be specific. Um, I really, I really love playing CDH. It's probably the... The way of playing magic that makes me absolutely just the happiest. While I love making casual brews and playing casually, there is just something about playing the most powerful cards in magic. With yeah, I mean, aside from the ones that are banned, <laughs> uh, there's just there's just something about that that really is just so incredibly satisfying. And I just this is a deck that I just I love playing so much. And I wanted to break down some of my card choices, the combo lines. Uh, to for all of you, so to see if you're you're interested in playing it. A little bit of history with this deck. I built a teamer food chain deck with the Omnath Locus of the Royal, and I really, I really, I really love blue and red together. And so having green, I mean, is obviously great for all of the enchantment synergies you get for playing food chain. And so one of my favorite ways to win. Um, outside of the obvious food chain line, is a loop with Deadeye Navigator and Dockside, and to be able to create infinite mana with that. And I just thought that was the coolest interaction. And I mean, in CDH, like, six mana is really, it's really kind of nothing. And so I really wanted to take that line with, uh, with Deadeye Navigator and Dockside and really just sort of build a whole deck around doing that, about abusing Dockside, about getting Dockside to play, about making tons of mana, infinite mana, and just winning off of that. And so that's what was my thinking when going into Omneth Locus of Creation. I didn't want to do a food chain deck with Locus of Creation because while, at, while white does add to enchantment tutors, I don't really think that's enough to justify doing food chain. And plus you have to run more dead cards uh, in the deck in order to like gear towards that food chain line. And I really wanted to layer in these in like, I really want to layer in the combos together so that you can have to try and maximize the card quality while in like maximize card quality and like balancing that with the wind conditions, which is always like sort of the struggle with CDH decks is, you know, what do you do when you're not winning? And so this deck Obviously very heavily relies on blue for the counter sweep, but we never want to be the control player. It's that's bad news. <laughs> we are light on value engines, so we don't we're not looking to outgrind other mid range strategies or Thrasios and Bruce Evolution or yeah, Bruce Tower Evolution, which would be sort of like the comparison for this deck. And we aren't running, you know, tons of rituals, so we're not going. We're not looking to outrun really fast decks like Blue Farm. So you might be asking, then, well, what the hell does this deck do? Where does it sit? And basically, it is a really adaptive and flexible deck that is looking to really time its of when it's looking to go off, depending on the pod composition and adapt its strategy. This deck is hugely explosive, thanks to our commander being able to ritual us with a fetch land. And so that's something that we're looking to take advantage of. And you can be pressuring to win, if not winning, starting I mean if you get the if you get the nuts draw, obviously turn one. But definitely you can start pressuring wins pretty regularly or threatening a win starting turn two and onward. And yeah, so I am I'm really just I'm stoked to the, I'm stoked about this deck. I will say this is a deck that is incredibly tailored to my playstyle. Um, I come from a history of playing Blue Red Storm, and when I first picked up that deck and started learning it and playing at uh, PPTQs and such, 
there was just no feeling in the world like when you're, you know, up against one opponent and, you know, at the time like Is It Phoenix was really big and Dredge and all of these and all these decks and, you know, just finding that moment and waiting to go off and just winning, you know, winning all in one turn, just like the the high that I got from that is was, you know, un unmatched until I started making this deck. And so for me, that's what I'm really, that's what I'm really looking to create. While not archetypally, philosophically, this deck is sort of a storm deck. You're looking to go off all in one turn to time it perfectly and to try and turn your cards that only help you, like would or ordinarily only help you with the win into also some, to, to, uh, to eke out some value uh, when you need to. <clears throat> Especially giving the uh, the the opposition agents and the whole reaches that you will you will frequently run into now. But all right, let's get into reading Omnath and seeing these cards and talking about what how the deck is looking to win. So we have Omnath, Locus of Creation, a four four legendary creature elemental for a red, green, white, and blue. It has landfall. It's got a, basically, it's got a fucking thesis. All right, well, actually, before we get to the landfall, when it enters the battlefield, it draws a card because it's green, probably, or blue, or both. And so that its landfall abilities are the first time it sees a land enter the battlefield this turn, you gain four life. The second time it sees a land enter the battlefield, you get to add a red, a green, a white, and a blue to your mana pool. And the third time it sees a land enter the battlefield, it will do four damage to each opponent in each planeswalker you control so as soon as i saw that third landfall ability i was like holy smokes how do we win with that because there's nothing i love more than just deck just hitting people for damage in the face it's excellent that's why i love teamer omnath is because it comes in and it just it hits you it hits everyone <clears throat> goes pew 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 and i i love that i i played niv mizzet perun Curiosity, and there's nothing more than just slapping a curiosity and if miss it and draw a new deck and just going pew 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 pew. I win. It's you know it's it's near and dear to me. But all right. So how are we looking to win with that ability? Well, we are looking to do. Let me get out. Where's where's my sweet boy? We have Dead Eye Navigator, of course, and Dockside Extortionist, and Dryad Arbor. Oh boy. There we go. So, let me move all my little doobly doos around. So, how this works is this also works with Emiel and Tamer Sabretooth and Baron Master Wizard, but I have pared down those four into just uh, those four like infinite mana enablers with Dockside into just Deadeye and Emiel. Team Sabretooth isn't in anymore, and same with Baron Master Wizard, because you bounce them back to hand, and then you have to recast them, so when there is inevitably a Rhystic Study in play, that makes it much harder, because, you know, as you're doing this loop, they're just drawing through their deck, unless you can pay one every time, which sometimes... If you are making enough treasures where you can pay the one, then that is beneficial. But if you're at the time where you're at a very slim margin and you can't pay the one, then it, it makes it sort of inevitable that they will finally draw the the free counter spell or the interaction in order to be able to disrupt with Baron Master Wizard or Teamer Sabretooth. So with Emiel and Dead Eye Navigator, with these two being the the ones that I picked, flickering just you know, repeatedly doing an activated creature ability and just flickering the things makes it a lot simpler and you don't have to worry about that. How much that actually matters? I couldn't tell you with any assured statistic, you know, with <laughs> with any, like, for sure numbers on that. But speaking from, like, the 200 games that I've played with this deck, you know, this makes it just a lot simpler. So, we'll do the loop with Dead Eye Navigator because it's a little bit more complicated because of the, the Soul Bond uh, ability. But basically, we have Dockside. We play Dockside, and we are hoping to make at least uh, three treasures. 
In order to initiate this combo, you need access to 10 mana when using Deadeye Navigator or 9 mana if you're using Emiel. So we play Dockside, we make at least 3 treasures, then we play Deadeye Navigator. The Soulbond trigger goes on the stack. So for Soulbond, to refresh all of you who haven't seen Deadeye Navigator in like 5 years, uh, you may pair this creature with another un unpaired creature when either enters the battlefield, they remain paired for as long as you control both of them. So, Deadeye Navigator resolves, it comes into play, Silpon Trigger goes on the stack, we pair, Do we pair Deadeye Navigator with Dockside Extortionist. Name a more iconic couple. And then, we uh, use two of our treasures to sack for, you know, one generic and a blue. And we activate Dockside's nearly acquired ability to exile this creature and return it to the battlefield under your control. So, we flicker Dockside. Dockside comes into play. The Soul Bond trigger goes on the stack with Deadeye Navigator. We decide to pair Deadeye Navigator and Dockside. Now we make at least three more treasures, and now we have demonstrated a loop where we generate infinite treasures. From here, if you have a... Uh, so from here, we have, inf you know, pick, pick your arbitrarily large number. From here, we cast Omnath. Omnath is going to ETB. We're going to draw a card. Now, depending on whether you already have Dryad Arbor in your hand or in play, we can flicker Omnath until we draw Dryad Arbor. If, uh, that is if we have a land drop open. If you do, you just play Dryad Arbor. And now... Here's where things start to get a little bit weird. So, so we play Dryad Arbor. We it enters the battlefield, so there's a Soul Bond trigger that goes on the stack, and we say Soul Bond, or we say that Dryad Arbor and Dead Eye Navigator are, are now paired. So we'll move. They're they're now paired. What we do now is we flicker Dryad Arbor three times, so we get three landfall triggers from Omneth. You'll gain four life, you'll get four mana, and you'll do four damage to each planeswalker and each opponent. Now we need to reset uh, we need to reset Omnath so that we can get a fresh Omnath who hasn't seen any lands enter the battlefield this turn. So what we need to do is we need to activate Deadeye Navigator to flicker it, and when it comes into play, it sees that it's unpaired and it's gonna pair it with Omnath. So now they're paired together. Now we, now that Omnath has the one and a blue exile of this creature, we activate that, flicker it, it comes into play, we draw a card, and then now we have to, now we have to reset Deadeye Navigator. So we're going to activate its ability, whoop, go over there. So we're going to activate its ability to reset it. Soulbond Bond Trigger goes on the stack, and we're going to choose to pair it with Dryad Arbor. Then, so now that we ha now we've demonstrated a loop, which results in us gaining four life, getting four mana, and doing four damage to each opponent in each planeswalker with each iteration. So you just keep doing that until they're dead. If you have already played a land for turn, there are Dryad Arbor being a creature. There are a huge number of creature tutors in this deck. There is. For one, there is Court of Calling and Eldritch Evolution, which can get... And there's also... There's one more. Neoform obviously isn't going to work because it has to be one, exactly one plus the, uh, the Sacrifice Creature CMC. So we can't get that. But we can... Oh, Finale of Devastation. You can play Court of Calling for zero. You can play Finale of Devastation for zero. And you can put Dryad, immediate, uh, Dryad Arbor into play. You can also... Uh, yeah. Or you can El Eldritch Evolution your Dockside since it's now pointless. And you can, you, know, you can put Dryad Arbor to play in that way. If you don't have a land drop available, I don't recommend using Dryad Arbor as the outlet for this combo um just because you have to go through more steps and it's annoying if you do have a line drop available this is really nice because you in order to win you only have to play three spells omneth dockside and deadeye once you have cast those 
then you just are activating creature abilities, which is honestly one of the greatest strengths of this combo. Obviously, if there is a Null Rod or a Stony Silence effect in play, this combo doesn't work, which is which is definitely one of the weaknesses since it falls to like both predominant pieces of hate in the CDH format or like meta. So if that happens, we do have other alternatives of uh, of what we can do. But I mean, we also we have green and red, so we're obviously running Nature's Claim. We're running a Braid. We're running Snap in order to bounce hate pieces back to hand. Uh, all this, yeah, all the uh, all that sort of good stuff. But that is something to be aware of. If you, uh, if your library is empty, you obviously don't want to deck yourself. So what you can do is when with uh, when you reset Omnath to an Omnath ETB goes on the stack to draw a card, you can respond to that and you know bounce it so that the draw card is on the bottom and the soul bond trigger is on the top. And then you resolve the soul the soul bond trigger, and you basically just keep responding to the ETB draw card, so that you don't have to worry about decking yourself. That is something to be aware of. Um, but yeah, so I really I really love this combo. Uh, like I you know a lot of people say that Drydar is a dead card. It's a mana dork who you know is summoning sickness. But you know what? I'm really fine with having basically one extra land in my deck that comes into play tapped for the utility that I get out of just activating creature abilities to win. And since it's just casting three creature spells, you know, not triggering Mystic Remora is honestly a, a kind of notable thing where, you know, people are a lot of times when players, especially like in Grixis, you know, they often play really, really greedily, and they're just, you know, banking on count drawing cards off of Mystic Remora, and the fact that you don't trigger it means that they don't draw interaction to interrupt it. You know, it's it's come up more than once. It's definitely, like, a little side benefit that's really nice. Uh, and so, yeah, so one of the other ways that we can win executing this loop is with, instead of Dryad Arbor being our outlet... Once we have infinite mana and we draw our whole deck, you know, we perform the same loop... Flicker Dockside, cast Omnath, Flicker Omnath, draw our whole deck. We can use... Oh no, did I not put it in here? That's fine. Oh well. Um, so once we draw our whole deck, we we'll, we can cast every single creature that's in our deck, of which we are running a total of 17, and we can cast a Finale of Devastation for some huge arbitrary amount to give them all haste and plus X plus X until end of turn and just swing in for the win. The thing that is about that's important to know about playing this deck is that you always want to try and you always want to do this loop before combat. You always want to win in your main, first main phase. Like, I mean, not always, but like almost always. It's very hard to think of a circumstance where you don't want to. We're not running anything like Orin Frostfang or Oakum Adversary where we would draw cards from doing combat damage or anything like that. So you're looking to win on your first main phase. Um, another one is, another strength of this line is that if there's a rule of law effect in play, that's actually really great for us because all we need to do is cast Dockside. And then next turn we cast Deadeye. And then next turn we can cast Omnath. And we just, and then we, from there, we can, and then play our, you know, and you can get a Dryad Arbor into play at instant speed with Court of Calling, and we can win at instant speed if, you know, if we need to on another player's turn, or we can win on our turn. And so, and that there, and the fact that there are a lot of stacks pieces, or hate pieces that say you can only play one non-creature spell per turn, well, I mean, that's fine. <laughs> like, Great! I would love to see deafening silence. <laughs> that's I think that's the one, right? Uh, so yeah, so this this line is it falls to some hate pieces, but it really benefits from others, and I definitely think that's one of the sort of strengths of this of this combo line. Um, but you know, sometimes you just your Omnath gets gilded draked. It, there's a null rod that you just can't find the interaction for. 
And so it it happens. And so for that, we are also running good old fashioned breach lines because having access to white and red and blue is fantastic. So let me do 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 do. Let me find the dudes. All right. So we have underworld breach. And Lion's Eye Diamond and Brain Freeze. So this is a really prevalent combo in CDH right now. This is like a way that a lot of like blue form decks win, or if you have like, you know, access to to red red, blue, and X. Um, this is, you know, this is this is definitely a way to win. So but for if you might not have encountered it, how it works is that we cast Underworld Breach. Now, either Brain Freeze or Lion's Eye Diamond, they could be in our graveyard or in our hand. As long, But as long as we're able to get an Underworld Breach into play, it doesn't really matter where they are as long as they're not in exile. The other thing that we need to execute this combo is we need three cards in our graveyard that we can exile and we, we won't care if we don't ever see them again. So, you cast Underworld Breach. If, uh, th there we go. And then we play Lion's Eye Diamond. Uh, Lion's Eye Diamond is an artifact for zero mana. It says, sacrifice Lion Lion's Eye Diamond, discard your hand, add three mana of any one color to your mana pool. Play this ability as, no, it says as a mana source. Oh yes, it is a mana source, but you, you can only do it at instant speed, not mana speed. And then, uh, and then Brain Freeze is an instant for one and a blue. It says target player puts the top three cards of their library into their graveyard and it has Storm. So whenever you cast a spell, copy it for each spell that has been cast before it. So that means you and your opponent's spells. So that can be relevant, that, that, you know, with a lot of interact, with, you know, CDH being very interaction heavy, that is important. So we cast Underworld Breach, and then either from our graveyard or from our hand, or if it's already in play, we play Lion's Eye Diamond. We then crack it, we discard our hand, and we add three blue mana to our mana pool. And then depending on where Brain Freeze is, we play it from our graveyard, we play it from our hand. And then we target ourselves to mill our library into our graveyard. That is really important because this is the fuel that keeps the loop going. So from there, Lion's Eye, Grave Lion's Eye Diamond is now in our graveyard. We cast Lion's Eye Diamond for its, ex for its escape cost by exiling three cards. And then we crack it for three more blue mana, discard our hand. So now it's back at our, back at our graveyard. And then we use two of that three blue to cast Brain Freeze and target ourselves. And you, now that's in our graveyard, and then we, you basically keep doing this until you eventually get the storm count high enough where you target your opponents with your brain freeze to be able to mill out each of their libraries. So this is, I love this loop. <laughs> it makes me really happy. So obviously the strength of this loop is that it only requires two mana to, to initially get the loop going and it's and only three cards yeah and only three cards in your graveyard so it's easy setup but it one of its weaknesses is that it's very fragile you know all of these are non-creature spells so each time you cast lion's eye diamond brain freeze the, the person with rhystic study and mystic remore are going to be drawing cards and they're going to be finding interaction to try and disrupt you with a force of negation also, if you just play, you know, a common thing is playing Underworld Breach and then someone in response casts Silence and it feels bad. <laughs> so, you know, it's like people have, you know, people have obviously teched to, uh, to disrupt this because you, everyone knows it and you're going to win if you get to do it. So that is definitely its weakness, but it is definitely balanced by the fact that 
like you can you can easily do this turn two, turn one maybe even with the depending on the in the rocks and the lands that you're able to play. Um, but yeah, and then obviously with uh, with one of my favorite cards of all time. Where is it? Did I not put it in here? Oh my goodness, shame on me. Uh, with intuition, which says for which is an instant for two and a blue. It says you go and get three cards with different names. Did they have to be? Yeah, you. Oh, I might be mixing up gifts. I'm good. Well, you get three cards and you target an opponent and your opponent decides which one goes in your hand and which one goes into your graveyard. And then so a uh, common intuition pile is Savin's Reclamation, Lion's Eye Diamond, and Brain Freeze. So obviously... With this one, or sorry, not Brain Freeze, Lion, uh, Lion's Eye Diamond, Savin's Reclamation, and Underworld Breach. So basically, no matter what they give you, you can get this started, and you just need to figure out a way to either to get Brain Freeze in your, into your hand or to your graveyard once you have your Underworld Breach resolve, which isn't that hard, because Intuition's in your graveyard, and once you have Breach resolve, you can just cast Intuition, and you can go get... Brain Freeze, uh, uh, Eternal Witness, or, you know, whatever. Or, like, in Protection, honestly, because no matter which ones you have Breach in play, it doesn't matter which one they give you. If Brain Freeze is in your yard and Breach is in play, then you can still cast it. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is a combo that I really enjoy doing. It's super fast. It's very fun. I love it. I obviously love everything, anything with the word storm written on it. Uh, so it is definitely, it's definitely a favorite of mine. And then also we can do really cute spell seeker things. So spell seeker is a card. It's, oh wait, come back on this. Uh, is a creature, a human wizard for two and a blue, a one, one, and when spell secret ETBs, you may search your library for an instant or sorcery card with CMC two or less, reveal it, put it into your hand and shelf your library. So we are also playing ephemerate and ephemerate is from modern horizons, a one white mana instant exile target creature. You control then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with rebound so when you cast it you can put it into exile and then on your next upkeep you can cast it for free without uh yeah you can cast it for free which is sweet so we can play spell seeker and then spell seeker gets ephemerate we cast ephemerate targeting spell seeker F spell seeker comes into play again and we can go and get uh, we can go and get, oh no, I didn't put that in here either. That's fine. We can go get Final Fortune, which is a sorcery for red, red. And it says, take an extra turn after this one. Or no, it's, sorry, it's an instant. It's an instant. Takes an, take, an, take an extra turn after this one. And then at the end of that turn, you lose the game. So this is, if you're, if you're confident that you're going to win, this is definitely an all in line. So you cast Final Fortune, you do anything else that you would like to do on your turn, go to your next turn, you untap, upkeep, your Ephemerate's Rebound uh, says, hey, you can cast me if you want, and you're like, yeah, cool, totally awesome, I'm going to flicker my Spellseeker, and then Spellseeker can go and get, depending on what's happening or, you know, what hate pieces are in play, what the, you know, and everything, there are a few different ways that we, we can go. Um, this layers really nicely in with both of our combos that we're running of the Underworld Breach or our infinite mana Dockside lines. So if there are, is if there's like a Graph Digger's Cage in play, uh, then we can use Spellseeker to go and get Eladomri's Call, which then we can use to, which is an instant for one and for a green and a white, to go get a creature card and put it into your hand. So you can go and get the, you know, the piece that you might be missing, whether it's Emiel or the Dockside, if, if you don't have it or if it's not in play. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. Do, do, do. If, for example, there's a Null Rod in play and we can't activate creature abilities, then you can go get Mystical Tutor 
During your upkeep still, you can cast Mystical Tutor to put intuition on top of your library. Go to your draw step, draw intuition, build your intuition pile to fill out whatever pieces you need of the combo in order to, to win with a breach line. So it's definitely, it's nice, it's nice flexibility. Ephemerate is really great aside from doing, you know, cute, cute spell seeker things. Even if you're not looking to win with it, to be able to cast Ephemerate and target spell seeker and you can go and get a piece of interaction and you can go and get brain freeze. You can get, you know, there's so many, there's so many great targets for two, for two mana. Um, you can also... I mean, having Ephemerate hit a Dockside and just flickering your Dockside for more treasure is also really bonkers. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. Def I like. I have definitely used Ephemerate to save my creatures from combat. Like, <laughs> you know, block with Omnath, it's gonna die. Then Flickerate ETB draw a card. It's you know, it's pretty decent. There's lo there's a lot of utility uh, in Ephemerate aside from just outside of you know, flickering spell seeker and trying to win. It's one of the cards that I just, I really love and have found that whenever I have it in my hand, it is always useful. Um, and same with spell seeker. That card is insane. It's easily one of the best cards in this deck. And yeah, so with that, one of the, uh, one of the things that I get asked a lot is, why are you playing Dead Eye Navigator? It's six mana. <laughs> which is which is valid. But let's pull let's pull my boy back up again. Here he is. Uh goodbye, spell seeker. So why why Dead Eye Navigator? It's six mana. Huh. And basically my answer is that six mana really isn't that much <laughs> which isn't probably a very satisfying answer but so to do the to do the loop with dead eye navigator versus emiel it's only the difference of one mana it's the six for dead eye two for dock side so that's eight and then plus the two mana that you need to initiate the loop to activate the the flicker ability that's like so that's a total of 10 mana Whereas MEL, it's four plus three to activate its ability plus two, so that's nine. And the difference between nine and ten mana is not that big of a deal, especially when you have access to so much fast mana and in mana rocks and mana dorks. And the fact that when we play in Crack of Fetch, we now suddenly have five mana that uh, available to us. So the total mana vested is kind of irrelevant in this deck. With uh, the thing that is really important though with Dead Eye Navigator that I really love the flexibility for is that there are a lot of games where I mean not a lot of games, but there's definitely there are definitely some pods where you get into and maybe people have slow starts. They're not you know, finding things, maybe there is, a, like, a stony silence effect in place that people don't really want to play their mana rocks, and there, I, there just might be a time where the artifact and enchantment count is really low. It's only at three, and the fact that we can win with only three in play with Dead Eye Navigator is fantastic. You know, that's only one thing for each opponent, and that is incredibly accessible. Um, so that is like one of the strongest, I think it's definitely one of the strongest upsides for this card and uh, definitely why I run it because the fact that you need four, I mean, it also seems like the difference between three and four with, uh, with Emil doesn't seem like it would come up that often, but I mean, just, just purely in my experience, that sometimes it makes just a, a world of difference. Um, you know, requiring one of your opponents to have two, uh, and then one for the other two opponents. You know, it just, it's come up. And that's the reason why I run it, and really, 
Six mana to cut to cast this card is not a big ask. Also, white mana in Omneth is incredibly restricted. Uh, white is the color that we definitely play the least. And so playing the two white for Emiel is often a big ask, um, depending on how many treasures that we make with our Dockside when we play them. If we're not sneaking our Emiel into play with like an Eldritch Evolution. Which I'll, let me pull up Eldritch Evolution. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, Eldritch Evolution is a sorcery for one green green as an additional to cost to cast it. Sacrifice a creature, search your library for a creature card with CMC X or less, where X is 2 plus the sacrifice creature's converted mana cost. Put that card into the battlefield, then shuffle your library and exile Eldritch Evolution. So, the cool thing is also, with our commander being a 4 CMC, we can sacrifice it to Eldritch Evolution to put Dead Eye Navigator into play, which is sweet. I mean, obviously, we can also do that with MBL to cheat the two, the two white mana for the cost. Um, it really just depends on, like, you know, what's happening at the table, how many artifacts or enchantments are in play. That is sort of the, the weakness of this deck. It, it is very dependent on what your opponents are doing. It's not... It's not looking to play solitaire. It's looking to interact. Um, it's looking to leverage, sort of, use our counter spells to leverage as tempo plays until we can time, uh, until we can time or assemble our pieces and time our win. Um, but I mean, yeah, I just it's and plus it's like a relic from the past of like five years ago. And if there's if there's any reason for me to play it, I mean, it's a pet card along with Dryad Arbor, so I definitely think it's worth a slot. There's a neat intuition pile where you can do, there's a, yeah, an intuition pile where you can do Deadeye, MEL, and Finale of Devastation, or Eternal Witness, and no matter what, you're getting the thing that you want, and you have to make your opponent to think, okay, well, how many artifacts, you know, blah, 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 and, you know, it just, it works out. Um, I don't know. I love these cards. Um, but, Yeah. So that is basically the, those are the main combos, what this deck is looking to do. And let's, with that, let's do some, let's do some mulligans and talk about what hands are keepable, how I would sort of sequence the early turns. So let's see here. All right. So for our first seven, um, as a sort of general rule for for what you're looking for with your hands so we need like the ideal hand would be two tutors two lands two or three lands a let's see so two tutors like two or three lands so that's five and then some and then a a card draw engine like Rhystic Study or Carpet of Flowers, and then uh, like some fast mana, like at least at least a dork, like either like two lands, two dorks, or like two lands and two artifacts, because um, we we're not trying to play Omnath as soon as possible. Um, it kind of depends on your hand. Um, but we are looking to try and like get get some er like some stuff out there uh, early, like with our with like dockside or or other things. But all right, so this hand it's kind of interesting. So we have a mystical tutor a stomping ground, an exotic orchard, a carpet of flowers, a nature's claim, a whole breacher, and a Dovin's veto. Hmm. This is not a keep. The mana is awkward. Like, Dovin's veto is such a good counter spell, but we would, like, it's only going to be good on our turn when we have carpet of flowers mana so that's just that's just a no we have no acceleration mm, yeah no we definitely can't keep this so we'll definitely go for a second seven 
So for our second seven, we have Veil of Summer, Intuition, Mana Vault, Pongify, Command Tower, Vexing Shusher, and Mana Drain. Ooh. Hmm. If I had one more land, I would consider keeping this. But as it is, because like, Mana Vault really just dumps our rocks into play for one, or we use it to like to help us cast a Ristic Study or an Intuition. So it's not, I don't know, it's if you have a Mana Vault in your opening hand, you really want two lands, especially because our you know our commander costs one of each color. Um, it can help us, I mean, Mana Vault can, can help us cast. Deadeye, which is really nice, but the sand is just, it's Aki. Weird. Yeah, no, definitely can't keep this. Alright, so we're going down to six. Steal another hand. There we go. <laughs> no land. Going to five. I mean, there are some, there are some no landers that we can keep. This is not one of them. There we go. Okay, let's see what we got here. So we're at five. Misty Rainforest, Chrome Mox, Pongify, Rejuvenating Springs, Brain Freeze, Stopping... Oh my god, this hand is so bad. No, there's no way in heck we can keep this. This is so much mana. So unnecessary. Mm -mm. No, okay. Going to four. Ooh! Ooh, Okay. So we have Underworld Breach, Emiel the Blessed, Exotic Orchard, Misty Rainforest, Git Probe, Dranth Magistrate, and Force of Will. Oh, Jesus. Well, we definitely have to keep this. If this was a seven, this would be sweet. Uh, well, no, because we don't have a tutor to get the other half of our combo, but... Alright, so let's see here. We would keep Exotic Orchard, Misty Rainforest... Draneth Magistrate and Git Probe. And we would like to try it, try and smooth out our smooth out our hand, fill it up a little bit more with the Git Probe, see what you know, see what someone else is doing. Jam a Draneth Magistrate, turn two, and really just sit back and wait for a wheel. <laughs> like honestly. Yeah. I think there's, mm, yeah, I know we don't keep the force of will. We're going to four. We expect other people to play interaction for us. Anyway, all right, let's go to go to another fresh, fresh seven. Oh, this is a lot of land. This is a lot of mana. All right, we have a braid, mana vault, scalding tarn, sylvan library, polluted delta, stomping ground, and a forest. Yeah. No. This is too much mana. We're sitting here. We're not doing anything. I will say, Sylvan Library is really good in this deck with Omnath because whenever you play a land and you gain four life, it basically buys you an extra card to Sylvan Library return. That interaction is really sweet, but that's not going to save us. Um, we definitely, if we had a tutor instead of a land, I would. I mean, I wouldn't keep it as a first seven, but. It's fine. It's not crazy. All right, so second seven. Oh, this is looking better. Bloom Tender, Windfall, Hallowed Fountain, Arid Mesa, Noctis Revival, Crop Rotation, and Pongify. So we have Bloom Tender, which is sweet. So that we have, we've got a Mana Dork on turn two. Noctis Revival, Crop Rotation. Hmm. Crop rotation is also cool because we can use it to get Dryad Arbor uh, and put it into play. It's not just for Guy's Cradle, which we are also running. But, yeah, no. This is kind of tempting, but yeah, just banking on the windfall. Eh, no. We can, get, we can definitely get a better six. So Force of Negation, Spell Snare, City of Brass, Avacyn's Pilgrim... Cyclonic Rift, Eternal Witness, and Bloom Tender. So if we go to six. 
but we don't do anything with this. Man, I swear there are good hands in this deck. <laughs> mm. Let's see, so if we play City of Breast and we play an Avacyn's Pilgrim, turn two, we play Bloom Tender. Turn three, we have access to green, white, and any color. Assuming we don't draw land. Yeah, no, we definitely can't keep this. This isn't keepable. Um, all right, so five. Hmm. Okay. Emil the Bless, Crop Rotation, Eladom Race Call, Command Tower, Time Twister, Deflecting Slot, and Verdant Catacombs. Hmm. Problem is, we can't cast the Time Twister or anything else. No, we'll have to go to four. So, Noxious Revival, Hollowed Fountain, Mana Drain, Final Fortune, Steam. Oh man, do, do, not, do not want to see Final Fortune in your opening hand. Steam Vents, Pongify, Cyclonic Rift. Yeah. Dang, was that going to five or going to four? I, I think this is. counter something you kill something but then we're not doing anything yeah nope all right going to four because sometimes it really do be like that mystery rainforest fruit and catacombs flooded strand windfall get probe vexing shusher i mean honestly <laughs> like as a it's not great but as a four i would keep Misty Rainforest, Flooded Strand, Windfall. Can I keep the third land so I guarantee I cast Windfall on turn three? It feels really bad if it gets countered. Hmm. Two lands. We are running base. We are basically running thirty lands in here. Uh, I think I would keep misty rainforest, flooded strand, verdict catacombs, and windfall. Yeah. All right. Let's do the other one. See if we can get an actual good seven. I promise there are good hands in here. All right. Forest, Mystic Remora, Noctis Revival, Llanowar Elves, Scalding Tarn, Misty Rainforest, Finhorn Elves. Turn one fish is, is fine. It's pretty good. We, we can kill it and then we can Noctis Revival it and <laughs> play it again. Um, that would be silly, but no, this is, this is too much mana. All right, second seven. Noxious Revival, Misty Rainforest, Pongify, Chrome Mox, Chain of Vapor, Rejuvening Springs, Sylvan Library. Yeah, this is hard because we don't have any, we don't have any tutors in here. And we're just banking on drawing with Sylvan Library. And we can't, can't guarantee the all of Omnath in our opening hand. I mean, nah, we can do, we can do better. Ooh, okay. This is a good one. This is what I like to see. All right. So we're at six. Land of War Elves, Neoform, Breeding Pool, Eternal Witness, Finale of Devastation, Hollowed Fountain, Mystical Tutor. So this is actually, this hand is, this hand is insane. So we, so we are going down to six. So we have to bottom one. We are going to bottom Eternal Witness. So how this would work, you would do shock in breeding pool, play a land war elves, turn one, turn two, shock in hollowed fountain, and then so we'd have three mana. We could we could neoform land of war elves into actually no, I think we keep 
No, we do bottom maternal witness because uh, we can uh, we can neoform Lanawar Lanawar elves into um into dockside extortionists, and depending on how many treasures that makes, uh, we could cast Omnath. Omnath comes in ETB trigger on the stack. We cast Mystical Tutor. We can then put. Actually, we don't need to get anything. Um, we can we can go and get a piece of interaction to protect the to protect our uh, to protect our combo, and then yeah, then you have finale of devastation. So you can either do finale of devastation to go get. Uh, depending on how many treasures that dockside makes. You can finale of devastation to go get uh, dockside, but I would honestly use the neoform for that because um, we can't neoform Omneth into one of our win cons since um, it has to be exactly if we sacrifice Omneth, it has to be exactly five CMC, and the only five drop we're running is Force of Will, uh, so we would have to we would have to use finale of devastation for that. Which I mean, it's fine. Uh, ooh, we could. I mean, yeah. There, yeah. There are lots of ways. It really depends on how many treasures that Dockside makes. But this is, this is a really, really good hand. Oh man, I would be stoked if I saw this in game. Ooh, all right. Let's do. Yeah. So I think that is good. I mean, this you can see. Um, sort of like this is like the best one of one of the best one of definitely one of the best draws that you can do with this deck and yeah i hope this was informative and that uh you all are maybe interested in checking out the list which i'll post in the show notes and yeah i you know always always happy to talk about my my four color jelly bean omnath and yeah do do all the do all the social media stuff follow me on twitter at staff of sage you can check out all of my decks on Moxfield at Staff of Sage. Hit me up, say hi. I have a Patreon, Sage of Fables. You can you can hit me up to make a deck for you. And yeah, that is uh, that is pretty much it. Happy happy to talk to you all, and have a good have a good week, friends.